Um, so this this was a AUC that you needed to find. It was a um, I hyperbola. So you can see that it did a good fit. So when I do those fits, those curve fittings, I, I dissed curve fitting in here the other day, but here it has a purpose, right? If I am not trying to model or explain anything, I, hey, did I actually ruin your guys' meal? Did you actually watch people eat? How many watch people eat after that? Did they have the fast phase and the slow phase? Did that happen? Nobody wants to admit to it, but I know you looked. <laughs> Friends probably ask, why are you staring at me when I'm eating? Leave me alone. <laughs> Watch them. See how many bites they take per minute at the beginning versus end. In fact, you can keep a little data log. <laughs> Watch them eat. So, um, you know, in, the, in that model that I showed you, my complaint about curve fitting was because there was, no per there, there was a purpose to modeling that used to tell us something new to tell us when there's a deviation in eating behavior, because if there's a deviation in eating behavior, maybe we can identify someone who's ill, that there's a purpose to it. And there you don't want to curve fit. Curve fit is kind of mindless and it gives you nonsensical predictions. But here, we just want to find the area underneath that rock curve. So the purpose here is to fit it with the best curve we can just for that purpose. So again, here, I, it's okay to curve fit. That was the best looking curve fit I experimented around. And um, it's not pretty looking. To find the area of the curve, I do the same steps as before. This is a U substitution, but it doesn't look like one because it doesn't look like it has inside stuff. Maybe it does look like it to you. Um, what would be the inside stuff here if you had to guess? What do you think? It's actually the denominator. It's got more stuff in it. I'll show you. It's a trick, actually. So um, in a regular Calc 1 and Calc 2 class, we make them learn all these different techniques of substitution. And on the test, on the final, they get a whole bunch of them. And they are supposed to know substitution on this one, the trick on that one. So they're supposed to know that. I'm not going to demand that of you because that's not a useful thing for you to, to know. But um, that is what we would expect from them. So I'm going to actually show you the trick and so that you know what it looks like here. Yeah, you do. You were here Monday, right? Yeah. Right. And I mentioned, I even pointed to the DX, what it means and what it, why it tells you. Remember the German girl that was grading? I told you about her. She would take off one point each for every time you missed the DX. She did that too. For both of them so you leave off the dx you don't know what you're integrating with respect to and a lot of times like i took the whole point i told you about the cumulative intake curves is because there's other letters in there so which one are you finding the antiderivative for which letter that dx tells you which letter so you have to have it yes always right because you're looking at um scores between zero and one grades Yes, that's an important thing. I don't think that you will have this, but I do know if in some of the chem classes, they think that you know the stuff like the back of your hand and um, they'll have like volume and they'll want you to find the integral of one over something with DV. So it's the letters change. And in a Calc 2 class, we would change all the letters because the whole thing is we know that they're going to be taking PCAM. Like if you go into PCAM and you don't know your Calc 2, you are so dead. You're so dead. It's, and so, I mean, that, that class is gearing them up for that. And so the letters can change. And so the models I showed you, there was no X's in the models because everything has meaning, right? T stood for time. E max stood for the amount you can eat. So when you do something real, you wouldn't put X there. You'd put what it means. Um, just like your, I'm trying to think what bio classes you have where you have letters in them. Genetics, you would, right? You have AA, the alleles, right? Yeah. So you have, you wouldn't call it, let's call that one X, let's call that one Y, let's call this one beta because we're out of X and Y. You wouldn't do that, right? So it would, everything you write down should make sense. When you program, everything you write down should make sense too. So when I first programmed, I used to put X, Y, beta, alpha, and my husband asked me, why are you doing that? What does that X stand for? And I said, it stands for the bunny population I said, why don't you call it bunny population? Because that's what it stands for. And so in most logical sciences, they don't use X's and Y's. So if it was A there, you put 
ADA, you know, right. <laughs> and in chem class, you do, it depends on who's teaching it. I know Kasner is very mathematical, so he might talk about surface area and things like that. Those are integrals, actually. The integral surface area is volume. So they're all connected. Do you guys see some of these things? I mean, they might assume that you just know it. Physics also, you might see it. They might assume you know it. The U here's the denominator. And it, this is totally a trick. It's substitution with a twist of trick. You go through the steps. Step one, make your U. Step two, find the DU. Step three, find the DX. So I'm just going through the steps, but now a little bit faster. This is a trick. So remember, this is substitution with a twist of trick. So yes, in this case, yeah. So here, here's the deal on this one. Um, it's not like, um, you know how I told you the Calc 2 students have a bunch of problems and they're supposed to pick and say, oh, I'm supposed to use substitution here. I'm supposed to use this thing here. On this one, it's a trick. So it's not like you look at it and go, obviously, this is substitution. You're going to see the trick in a second. So um, if you have, and I would say even if you haven't seen the trick before, you probably wouldn't come up with it yourself. It's not, you have to have seen it before. So, but that's how we do this problem is by substitution. So it's not as obvious as the other one. The other one's obvious. There's an inside. You let you be the inside, and it's obvious you should use substitution. Here it's not obvious because it's going to be a trick. So watch as the drama unfolds because there's going to be a trick. So I even tell you it's a twist of trick here. Um, the trick is this. If you look at the numerator, 0.02x, you can remember the whole object of the game is to Game of Thrones is to get rid of the x's and to replace them with u's. That's the whole object. So the numerator, you can actually solve. You have that u is equal to 0.02x um, right here plus 0.04. You can actually solve for the 0.02x. That's u minus 0.0004, and you can replace the numerator with that expression. Um, u minus 0 0.004. And you're asking yourself, you should be asking yourself, how does that make anything better? Didn't she say it's supposed to look better? It looks kind of messy still. I'll show you. I'll wait till you write everything down and I'll move to the next slide. This is what I have so far. I have 0.02x is equal to u minus point. I'm just rewriting. You don't have to rewrite. I just put it on the slide so I can have some continuity. Um, I know that dx is one point or divided by 0.02 du. I know that what u is. And now I need my lower limit and upper limit, just like I did before. Um, lower limit and upper limit are found by plugging in the 0 and the 1 into the transformation. And now I'm ready to do my substitution. So in for the top goes this, u minus 0 0.004. In for the bottom goes u. In for the dx goes what I have for dx. It's the same business. It's the same set of steps that I did in dirty detail on the toy problem. Nothing has changed. Lower limit changed. Upper limit changed. So the steps are all the same. I told you it's not it's not it's not easy here. It's the like, um, messy stuff. <clears throat> Many of the students in Calc two where they spend a lot of time doing this say that um, it's a lot of pre-calc because you have to like transform. Like pre-calc is a lot about moving things around, right? It's not as much a. So they have Calc one and then they go to Calc two and man, they hate you. They hate you when you teach Calc two. <laughs> Is everybody kind of with me so far? Okay. Kind of with me, Rihanna? Because I'm not asking for 100% with me, just kind of. Jewel? Yeah, but I have a question. Um, how does you change the 
So do you see like um, the whole objects get rid of all the X's? So I got the, I let this stuff be my U. So that got rid of the X on the bottom. But then I was able to solve for the, the, the top is 0 0.02 X um, is going to be U minus, because I can subtract this from both sides. So I can make the top entirely in terms of U. So now the X has disappeared from the top. It's disappeared from the bottom. It's uh, disappeared from the DX. And it's disappeared from the limits. So no more X's. We're all U's. Clear? Okay. Just copied and pasted, so I haven't done anything different. How do I integrate that? Here's the trick. Do you remember when you're little and they used to get make you get common denominators? Like if you had one half plus one third, then you'd have to make both denominators the same. It could be six, right? Well, you can go backwards. You can take something that had a common denominator and split it backwards. So that's what I've done here. And I'm tired of being in my little box. Okay, so um, if you go to this step, right? Okay, so this is the top of the top. So this had a common denominator. When you were little, you were supposed to go that way, right? So now I'm telling you to go the other way because it actually makes it easier to integrate. That's the whole purpose. You're trying to make this so that you can actually find this antiderivative. And it might not be clear to you what the antiderivative is yet, but that's why I told you it's a trick. I've seen it before, and that's why I know it. Not only I've seen it before once, I've seen it before probably every semester. Uh, a good way to put this is just because someone got an A in Calc 2 and you show them this problem a year later does not mean they will be able to do this problem. They'll have to remember that trick or be so independently clever they could come up with that trick on their own, which I highly doubt. Because I copied and pasted again. That's the last step, so we didn't get this step down. This is the next step, the double step right here. Um, that was the backward common denominator thing, like splitting it back up into pieces. The u over u becomes 1, and I have this guy over here, which I'm going to show you. Actually, can you see what the antiderivative of, what is the antiderivative of 1 over u? That's, when you take the derivative, you should get 1 over u. What expression gives you the derivative as 1 over, one over x? Ln x, right. So the antiderivative of this, see if you make mistakes this time, you get a lot of ln there. My sister hated Cal 2. And she was in pre-calc. She said, still, by mid-semester, because you, you always use the volume equals mass, um, density times mass. So you'll get a 1 over V when you solve for mass. And you get these integrals like dV over V. And she said, still, mid-semester, there are people that couldn't understand that. It was log V. And she said, even I understood it after a while. I remember it was log V because it showed up on every one of their tests. So the antiderivative of 1 is U. Just you should be able to go backwards. So I told you this is about bookkeeping. Um, I always make a mental check. Take the derivative of u. Do I get one back? Derivative of the it's just the coefficient, like there's no power here. So the derivative of u is one. The derivative of natural log u is one over u. So I get that. So I'm able to go backwards and forwards. So I just do a mental stop check to make sure that my antiderivative and derivative work out. And um, my, I shouldn't have done this. It was out of habit. But this 0 0.004, it really goes to the side, right? So it's really 0 0.004 times 1 over u. So the antiderivative of 1 over u is natural log u. And um, the reason I mentioned that is one of the reasons the students who had Calc 2 and then took PCAM were so confused is because it was dv over v. We write 1 over v times dv. So they didn't make that connection that those two things are the same thing. And so those two things are the same thing. Good so far? Kind of? Bella? Well, I've this, when the little squiggle goes off, when this goes off, I'm actually finding the antiderivative. What is the antiderivative of 1? What will give me 1 when I take the derivative? No, one's derivative is zero. It has to give me one as the answer. Two's derivative is zero, too. X's derivative is one. The derivative of X is one. 
Do you believe? What's the derivative of x squared? What's the derivative of x? One. X to the one, one times x to the zero, which is one. So this is why this is hard. It's hard because you have to have superior command of derivatives, which you just got, right? You just you, you haven't had time to really absorb that. You have to have a superior command of that. You have to have a superior command of math 100. You have to have a superior command of if you go further. You have to have a superior command of all the special functions from calc, from pre-calc. So that's why um, people hate calc two. This line, okay, it's just a reminder to me that I'm supposed to go f of b minus f of a. So if I drop it off, then that's not there. This is not hanging there anymore, and I'll forget to do it. It's a bookkeeping thing. And if you leave it off, German grader will take off the point. It's like you haven't really done the right thing. You've left off the limits. That's what she'd always come and say. They cannot just say these things. They must actually show it. It just sounds vicious with a German accent. And no student complained. So that's what I was missing, my German accent. I was born in Germany. I spoke only German before I came to the States. But I lost my German accent. Just imagine what kind of teacher I would have been if I kept that German accent. <laughs> okay, so next step. I copied and pasted the last step. So if you didn't finish copying the previous slide, that's the very last step I had. Um, how do I evaluate? I have to do the f of b minus f of a. And it's, now it's just plug and chug. Can you tell me where the mistakes will show up? If at this step, oh, it's so awful to make a mistake at this step. You did everything right and you made a mistake here. What do you, the parentheses, because it's f of b minus f of a, so that minus sign changes the signs of everything inside. So just imagine, if you have minus sign issues, there's something in this for everyone. If you hated math 100, guess what, it's here. If you hated pre-calc, guess what, it's here. If you didn't like the derivative stuff, guess what, it's here. There's something for everyone. There's a little fun for everyone in this. Is, is that equation equal to the last one? Is that a minus sign or minus? Minus. So this part here is, um, oh, and then this should be, actually, this should be copied down here. 0 0.0204 should be right here. So let, let me change that so that it's in here. You're lucky I didn't have a calculator to take this any further. Oh, wait, no, that was right. That was right. I second guessed myself. Didn't I tell you guys never to erase your work? So it's fine. It's fine the way it was. So this is f of b. The b was 0 0.0204. It goes in. And then f of a is 0 0.004. So that goes in the thing. So that was correct. Okay, so whatever this number is, you guys can fill it in. It's the formula from Monday, f of b minus f of a, which I'm not faulting you for because you had one day to really absorb that. Monday's class, f at 1 minus f at 0. You remember that? Yeah. Vaguely? <laughs> so um, I have high school teachers sometimes looking at my classes on video, and what you know what they say? Holy moly, it's fast. Right? So you had one day to take a new topic, internalize it, absorb it, and know it like the back of your hand. So I'm not faulting you for that. But you know now you'll know where it's coming from. It's coming from Monday's lecture. Monday's lecture I had I did a little slower, so and so you can fill in this number. How will you know if you're wrong or right? What do you know about that number that you get? If it's over one, you know something went wrong because it's supposed to be the area under our ROC curve and that's supposed to be a number underneath one. Um, what if it's negative? It's wrong too, right? It's supposed to be between 0 and 1. 
And most likely, if it was a decent curve, it should be between 0.5 and 1.